the juxtaposition of those two chants we had just now. On the one hand, the chant that says, subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. And then the other one that starts out, may I be happy. May all living beings be happy. That's the human predicament. We're sitting here in this body. It's going to age, grow ill, and someday it's going to die. And yet we want to be happy. And we want to be happy in a way that doesn't cause any suffering to anybody else either. Which, if the mind is constantly weighed down with aging, illness, and death, and separation, it's very difficult. You notice that most people are cruel when they're, when they're suffering. When you see a cruel action, it usually comes from a feeling of the person is feeling weak, feeling threatened, at their wit's end. And acts of compassion are the ones that come out of a feeling of well-being in the mind. So when we look for true well-being, look for true happiness, it's not a selfish desire. But we're stuck with that problem. This body is going to age, grow ill, and die. Our mental faculties are going to go away. And how are we going to handle that situation when it comes? Or how are we handling it as it's beginning to encroach on us? That's what the fifth contemplation is about in those five contemplations we had. I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions. Because it's through our actions that we can make a difference. The Buddha said basically there are four kinds of action. There's skillful action, unskillful action, a mixture of the two. And then there's action that goes beyond action. In other words, the action that leads you outside of the cycle altogether. So this is what we're working on here as we meditate. Is One, learning what it is means to act. As the Buddha said, action comes from intention. So we start our practicing meditation to get to know our intentions. One way to do that is just to set up an intention in the mind and see what happens. Like focusing your attention, intention on the breath. Just say, I want to stay with the breath for the hour. Breath comes in, breath goes out, that's all I want to notice. That's all I want to worry about. And see how long the intention lasts. Well, if you have, if your powers of mindfulness are strong, your powers of alertness are strong, you can maintain that intention. If they're still weak, well, you just set the intention up again. Set it up again and again and again. Don't give in. But if you can't, because if you can't make this little kind of intention and stick with it, how are you going to deal with larger issues in life? And if you don't have the mindfulness and alertness to maintain this much, then how will they be able to help you through more difficult situations? So we're training these mental faculties in the same way that you train the body. Strengthen the body. If you want to be strong, you don't go out and buy a new strong body from somebody else. You just take your weak body and you exercise it. And it's through the exercise that it make it strong. So you exercise these qualities of mind that can help make your intention stick. And you begin to see that as you maintain that intention with skill, it really does make a difference in the mind. Because you have the mind a new foundation for its well-being. You don't have to depend on a body. You don't have to depend on people outside you. You've got a skill within the mind that's purely mental using the body as a foundation, but it's developing those mental skills will make a difference. Once the mind has this sense of center, then there's a sense of stability and steadiness that it brings to your life. You're not constantly subject to the buffeting of forces from outside. No matter which direction the wind blows from, you can stay steady and still. And watch. See what's going on around you. It's our ability to stay still like this that enables us to see. If you're streaking through life, 
all you see is the blur on either side. It's only when you stop and stand still that you see not only what's going on around you, but also what's going on inside. Those very subtle movements of the mind that can cause you to get attached to things that are going to change on you. You begin to realize that the, the mind's habit of latching onto the body is not something it necessarily has to do. Its habit of latching onto feelings or perception or thought constructs, awareness of this or that. It doesn't have to latch on to those things. It latches on because it doesn't have any better place to go. There's a feeling of a dependency on these things. It wants to feed on these things, see what kind of nourishment they give. And sometimes they give a little good nourishment, but for the most part they give you, they give you junk food. And as the Buddha said, it says the mind's habit of feeding like this, that's what, caught, that's what its suffering is. So what we try to do is give it something better to feed on, a sense of well-being inside. sense of well-being that comes as you learn to adjust the breath, settle down into the breath, make friends with the breath, learn to savor the breath the same way that you would good food or good music. What does this flow of energy feel like as it comes into the body? What kind of flow would the body like to feel right now? Do you know? Most of us live in the body for how many years and we don't really know what, the, what kind of breathing the body would like to do or what would be good, what would feel good for the body right now. So take some time to explore that, get to know it. And as you develop this inner sense of well-being and stability, you find that the mind would much rather feed here than feeding outside. And even though there may be still some stress and slight sense of burdensomeness in having to feed here, at least it's better than the other stuff the mind tended to feed on before. You begin to look back on you know, thoughts of lust, thoughts of anger, thoughts of greed. And you begin to wonder, why did I ever want to feed on those? What kind of nourishment did they provide? Really nothing solid or substantial or healthful at all. So you learn how to let go of that. You learn to stop feeding on those things that are bad for the mind. And when you're not weighing the mind down in that way, when you're not giving all this junk food to clog up its arteries and things, there's a greater sense of lightness, a greater sense of well-being. When the mind feels light and well like this, then it's much easier for you to be compassionate not only, not only to yourself, but to people around you. Ultimately, you get to the point where the mind is so well fed and so strong that it doesn't have to feed anymore at all. That's when the mind is totally free. It's like when you go out camping. One of the big problems in going camping is you have to carry your food. Carry it everywhere you go, and that puts a limit on how far you can go and how many days you can, you can go out on a particular trip because you've got to keep your food stores low enough so you can carry them, but not so not so low that you're confined to one or two day trips. Think of how much you could wander around if you didn't have to feed. There have been times when I felt I'd just like to wander off into the canyons of Zion and just disappear. We can't do that because the body needs to feed. As someone says, you can't eat the scenery. But when you put the mind in a position where it doesn't have to feed, then it's really free. It's not weighed down by anything. It's not confined by anything. This is what the Buddha meant by nirvana. The word nirvana comes from the fires going out. And back in those days, they had this conception that the fire fed on its fuel and was trapped by its fuel because it had to feed on it. it kept clean there, getting its sustenance from the fuel. But when it went out, it was released from the fuel. It let go of the fuel and was released. And then it was no longer confined. You couldn't even, couldn't even describe it as existing, non-existing, both or neither. It was that free. So 
So that's what the Buddha was talking about when he said the nirvana, okay, the mind doesn't have to feed anymore. And when it doesn't feed, it's not confined to its food source. It doesn't have to carry its food source around. It isn't limited by where there's food and where there's no food. And you look back and you realize that the steps along the practice that you were following was precisely that fourth kind of karma, the karma that leads to the beyond karma, the fourth kind of action. Through observing the precepts, practicing concentration, and developing discernment into what the mind needs to feed on, what it doesn't need to feed on, what kind of feeding is good for it, what kind of feeding is bad for it, and then feeding it in such a way that ultimately it gets so strong it doesn't have to feed anymore. It can let go. And at that point, entirely new dimensions open up in the mind that you couldn't even have conceived before. That's ultimately where the practice leads. Trains the mind, takes this mind which is feeding on the body, feeding on feelings, perceptions, thought construct, consciousness. Basically says, look, there are better things to feed on. If you feed on these things, you're going to be really sorry because your food source is going to run out on you very quickly. It's going to keep changing. And with that sense of instability, uncertainty in life, how can the mind find any sense of well-being? At the same time, it turns out that a lot of this food is junk food. So the practice takes the mind and teaches it better ways to feed. Through the practice of the path. And the path finally issues you issues in a point where the mind is at total equilibrium, doesn't need to feed anymore, and can let go. So that's where we're headed. As the Buddha one time said, the only two things he teaches is suffering or stress, and then the end of suffering. And it may seem like a narrow idea. We say, well, what about you helping mankind and humankind? And all the other great issues. Well, he says, straighten out your own mind first. And then you can find that when that's straightened out, when you're really free, then the type of help you can give to other people is the best kind of help. There's no hidden agenda, there's no hidden need to feed on the sense of pride or whatever that comes from being a very helpful or important person, which can actually spoil the help, spoil the compassion. It's a sense of compassion that comes from total freedom, which is ultimately the only, only compassion that you can really trust. 